Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to April at the Java User Group. Um, I'm back, missed the last couple months, but uh, it's good to be here. Housekeeping slide that sort of ended up in our slides and seems to be permanent. Um, at the end of the meeting, we, we do go across there and free up the room for the band that's in here after us. Um, and uh, don't forget to settle up your bill if you've ordered drinks or food. Um, I don't think we had a problem recently, but it's a good reminder. And um, we have a mailing list. We have a Google Plus community. And uh, you should sign up for either one or both. Um, meetings are announced on, on both of them. And uh, any other news. And uh, we record all of these meetings and put them on Vimeo and link them on our website. And you can watch the full, uh, full meeting if you want to review something or if you have a friend who couldn't make it and you want to let them know. Uh, you can check it out. <coughs> all right, news. So uh, new Java releases, Java 7 update 21 and Java 6 update 45. I don't think there was supposed to be any more Java 6 releases, but they're still releasing. <coughs> Months running now have you announced the critical update? Oh, they're critical, critical security updates, so make sure you update. There's like a website called Days since like last Java vulnerability. That one? Or something. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that update came out about a week ago, <laughs> and um, this is less than a week old, so the, the, um, that update is currently vulnerable. So if you download Java right now, you're vulnerable. You, you, there's, no, there's no fixed Java right now. Um, you should probably still update because it might fix some of the problems, but um, this is mostly problems with the Java plugin. This one, this exploit is definitely with the Java plugin. Um, it's uh, escaping the sandbox again, like usual, uh, with the reflection bug. Um, if you don't use the Java plugin for anything, you don't need to worry about these quite so much, but it's still... Uh, mm-hmm or doesn't use the Java plugin, or just delete it. <laughs> um, so Mike Reinhold, Mark Reinhold made a good uh, long blog post about security and Java and Java 8 and the timelines and what to do about features and what's going on with that. Um, so uh, Project Lambda missed its milestone. A few other things did as well. Um, so that was they were maybe not going to put them in Java 8, and then they thought that that would make Java 8 not very exciting. So um, they're going to wait until they can fix security bugs, get Project Lambda in there, and, well, this is the proposal anyway, and um, then release it. So they're thinking early 2014 instead of, it was supposed to be mid... It was supposed to be um, Q3. Java, like around Java 1. Yeah. And then Java 9 two years later. So um, there's a link for the blog post that you can we click on when you download these. We wonder what the technical keynote will be about this year at Chapel 1. Maybe security? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, new version of IDEA um, with JavaFX 2 support. Um, I don't know, anybody here using JavaFX for anything? I know one of my friends, Andrew, has been porting all his Swing stuff to JavaFX because he says it's way better. Yeah, he's been really excited about So if you're, if you're using Swing, you might want to check out JavaFX. JavaFX. It's cool, and there's lots of great tooling for it now. And um, they added some more Gradle support. So it's very cool. And that link is wrong, so don't click on it. <laughs> That's from the previous slide they edited. OK. Um, Aaron Gupta did a really cool workshop with a bunch of kids um, teaching them Java because they wanted to mod Minecraft, which is a very popular game written in Java. Um, one of the very, probably one of the most common uses for Java on the desktop and one of the reasons people use Java, but they don't even know necessarily. Anyway, he had a whole bunch of kids get together and he published this as a, a nice packaged workshop and um, it's worth, worth checking out um, or maybe repeating. If you've got, got some people you want to introduce to programming or introduce to Java. What is the age group, do you know? This is also a good opportunity to mention that we're trying to organize a DevOps for Kids event. 
Uh, Adrienne has created a Google group for that purpose, and you posted a link to the T jar. Yeah, it's missed, right? We can. We should also post the link to that group to the Google Plus community. Yeah. And uh, we basically just need to start a discussion, brainstorm ideas. This would be an excellent idea mm -hmm. to think about. Um, Anyone who's interested in I think I think all these guys are young ladies young teens. Ladies living code people, uh, lady for that too. Yeah, so that's an excellent suggestion. That's a very good idea. <laughs> I think I think once we get the discussion started there, things will start to move. For sure. All right. And uh, that's all the news I've got. It's been a bit of a slow news month. Does, does anybody have anything else? Exciting Java news? Stuff you've heard, new releases, uh, stuff you worked on. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> nope. All right. Well, I'll hand uh, hand it over to Mike, who's going to talk about uh, Array and right. doing cool client-side HTML5. <laughs> All right. Hey everyone. Um, now, I, Jonathan preempted me a little bit by uh, when he posted this to the to the to the list. I hadn't had like an official name or anything like that for the for the talk. So I came up with this one, which is which is array plus HTML5 equals happy. That's the name of the talk today. And um, um, I'm, I'm just going to take you through something that really, I mean, really, I mean, array has has been like a. Um, around for a few years. It's actually been presented here before, like in various forms. I think when I first presented it here at the Jug, it was like a very early prototype. Uh, a, the, the good people at Red Hat were like, uh, were seemingly impressed with what I had done with the uh, SOA platform at, uh, at Red Hat. And they were like, okay, you should just go off and do something, right? And my boss, Mark Little at the time, told me that I should just, I should find something to do. And um, I, was, I was interested in, in in this idea that browsers were becoming more like application platforms in and of themselves. I thought it was quite curious that we could, we could start doing some serious things like running real serious uh, computing tasks inside the browser. Um, you know, V8 uh, at the time, it was, was fairly new at the time from, from Google and uh, Fire, uh, Firefox, of course, had uh, TraceMonkey and all these JavaScript engines that were, that were starting to get really, really fast. Um, and so, and, and so over the over the course of time, we, we started trying to figure out well how as a as a you can see actually I, I say I keep working for Red Hat but I actually work in the JBoss division and of course we're we're a Java middleware company and so one of the things that we were trying to figure out how to do was well how do we how do we take like all this Java experience that we have and how is is there a way that we can leverage this this intellectual capital and these 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 ways of doing things and bring them into the browser and of course around this time we had come to the attention of uh, of Gwit or the Google Web Toolkit um, which uh, it's 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 a really interesting project um, you know it, it has its failings and we'll talk about that uh, as we go forward in many ways Arai is an attempt to fix what we perceive as failings in, in the Google Web Toolkit. Uh, uh, and, and, and in fact, I would say that what I'm going to talk to today is about trying to um, come up with better ways of doing things in GWT, right, rather than the GWT way. So we're using GWT as a technology which turns Java code into JavaScript um, and produces basically native HTML5 applications that we can work with, um, but, but does so in a way that, 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 that's more familiar to people and, and, and more natural, for pe especially for, for J2EE developers. Um, so one of the interesting things too is that Arai is actually directly involved in the future of GWT. Uh, we, as a project, uh, uh, myself in particular, sit on a steering committee that Google established, uh, which is to, to sort of bring in outside influence into the project. So you know, sort of, so the so. There's things that we would like to have to happen in Google Web Toolkit and things we'd like, the patches and things we'd like to see happen. So we have a direct influence over that. And so Arai is actually one of the, the, the most significant projects in the GWT community today in terms of like, you know, where, where GWT is going. And, and in fact, a lot of the, the things that we've discovered, the problems with GWT, the limitations, some of these are widely known, um, that are being addressed in Arai 3.0 in many ways are a result of some, some of the sort of pressure that we've put on Google uh, um, from our side, and, and that's like an ongoing discussion there. 
We're currently working on our third and biggest release. I'm actually, what I'm going to be showing you tonight actually comes from this release, uh, Arai 3.0, uh, which we plan on releasing in a completely final, complete and stable version in the fall. Uh, but I'm not going to be showing you a lot of the features of it. I'm going to be focusing on one today, one specific feature. And, uh, and we'll get to that, but I'd also like to mention that slides suck, so I'm not going to be showing you many slides today. I'm going to be showing you actual code and um, type things into the IDE and, and push a button and see what happens type thing. So, um, so for those of you who never, don't know what Arai is, Arai, I mean, Arai really is, like at its core, it's like this giant framework that does all this stuff, but like when you really distill it down, it's really this giant compiler extension. Uh, it, underst it, it is filled uh, underneath the brim of it uh, with this giant you know, code generation framework and all these other crazy things that figure out how to interpret you know, the code you write against interfaces and annotations and turn it into something um, that runs in a browser the way that you would have expected it to run if you had run it in the JVM. Um, and of course, you know, most of the credit belongs with GWT in having that magic happen, but we, we do a lot of high level stuff. Uh, we, for example, have things like JPA running in the client. Uh, uh, Jonathan, of course, can, can take almost total credit for that. Uh, we have uh, CDI running in the client uh, with, with, with CDI events which can propagate between the client and the server. That's something that, that Christian and myself um, worked on before, before Jonathan came to the, uh, came to uh, the project and and it works and it's it's really really cool and, and you'll see some of that today maybe not maybe not uh, client side JPA today although I think it's it, it, it I hope I hope later on this year when we when we ship or I 3.0 with like the new data synchronization features and stuff that might be worth an interesting talk and I'm sure some people would like to see that happen um, so Arai likes static typing. There's obviously this big argument, you know, uh, in in the web development community. You know, should I just use native JavaScript? JavaScript's the language of the browser. Let's just write everything in plain JavaScript. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like opposed to this idea of JavaScript. There's there's plenty of good reasons to use JavaScript. I don't think Arai is a one-size-fits-all solution, and I never sold it like that. Um, but there also, there's, there's a lot of people out there who want to use different languages in the browser for various reasons. Um, we think that there's, a, there's, there's something that can be won when you use Java in, in the browser, cross-compiled, especially when you're using uh, something like Java EE6, which we've been able to sort of bring into the client and sort of unify the programming model there. And we think that when you do something like that, you know, you get the benefits of being able to type check your client classes against your server classes because they can share model, they can share validations, they can share this stuff. When you update a validation on the server, you don't have to then go and update it in JavaScript. You don't have to update a client side validation, you don't have to update a server side validation, and they don't have to go and verify that they, that they both result in the same thing. You can write that validation once and it, and it just works. And we think that for you know, many classes of applications, especially in, in the corporate environments, uh, you know, where, you know, large intranet applications, you know, uh, big CRM applications and things like that, this sort of thing can be, can be really uh, a godsend. Um, Arai, Arai also enables like really, really complex things that would be really, really hard to do on your own. And that includes like, you know, stuff that you might do in JavaScript. Because we're not just taking things like the CDI programming model into the client. We also do a lot of advanced things. Like we have this Arai bus framework. Uh, we have a data synchronization framework, which is coming down the line. We also have this new um, OT framework, which is coming down the line. We also have this asynchronous code loading system, which is, which is in, in, in Arai 3.0. And these are all really, really hard things to to do. Um, you know, uh, required JS, for example, uh, allows you to do some of the stuff that you do with asynchronous loading. But in this case, the Java, the Java side wins by a long shot because we can split code and figure out how to uh, prioritize code loading uh, at, at runtime just simply by doing a static analysis of the code. When you actually see like what JavaScript developers have to do to do deferred loading with required JS, you end up like a 3,000 line like like configuration file and required JS, and it's really, really hard to maintain and really, really hard to reason about. So you know, static typing and uh, it does give us the ability to do things which would, which are almost nearly impossible to do by hand in JavaScript. Now, of course, there are solutions in JavaScript like using cl the Closure compiler from Google, which is actually just trying to basically solve the same problem, which is add static typing to JavaScript. 
Um, but anyways, um, at the end of the day, um, you know, contrary to popular belief, you know, Arai spits out at the end of the day native HTML5 applications. They're regular HTML5 applications, they're comprised of HTML files and JavaScript files, and they load into your browser that way. They run on your iOS device, uh, they run, you know, they run on, on an Android device, they run on anything that can understand standards compliant. And they, it, can, they can be completely static applications and just service files if you don't want to service them. Yep. I mean, you can build entire Arai applications that have no server-side component and never even try to do anything with the server. Um, and there's no, everything we do when we package these applications up to run in the client, we're actually, we're, we're compiling all the infrastructure down to JavaScript necessary to run that application. It does not have to do round trips to the server to go and get validation data. It doesn't have to do any of that. It truly is a client-side application. And, and some people don't think that of GWT. We, we, run a, we run across people who seem to think that GWT like round trips to the server and it requires some sort of server compiler that sits there and like reacts to the needs of the client in real time. And a lot of people are turned off by that perception. But that's actually not what it does. It's, it, it has never done that. It, it's, 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 it really is a static compiler. You know, fire and forget. Here's my JavaScript and I can just use it. Um, so. I've already kind of preempted myself. So really, I mean, in the, in the Java versus JavaScript debate, uh, I would say, I, you know, I, I mean, I don't really think that the, it's like, you know, really worth getting getting into. I think there are good reasons to use JavaScript. Like if you're if you're starting like a, a, a small website and you want to build some forms, you want to do some nice stuff, you know, sure, like Angular or, or jQuery, you know, is going to be a, a good solution to get up and running really quickly. We focus on, you know, we focus on 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 different things. Um, you know, we focus on sort of building large applications that are ba that have large teams. Like we we envision people building projects on Arai that have four or five developers committing across the same code base. Um, a lot of people would say, well, you know, you can you can do that with JavaScript, and you can. But there are serious problems to it because JavaScript doesn't force you to follow a, a particular schema. You're not forced to structure your classes or your, or your logic or anything in a certain way. And when you have five people committing code at the same time, they have to be very, very disciplined about following preset rules. The language is not enforcing that for them. Languages like Java give you some of that. They, 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 te they ensure that you know some some developer over here isn't going to try and do something that's really, really clever that mutates some state and as it like trickles through like a whole series of methods and then someone down the line discovers, well, wait a second, this property, like some property was introduced with, with uh, you know, they overwrote some property now with like a function reference instead of a property and I expected it to be a property. And I mean, those are the sorts of things that start to happen. I mean, Google talks, Google I.O. had a talk last year about this uh, and how they have, to how they have to use the Clojure compiler. Like when they're developing Gmail and, and, and things like that, they tried to do it by just doing it the JavaScript way. And I've heard people like Douglas Crockford and stuff say, well, they just don't know how to do JavaScript right. But I mean, these are probably like some of the best JavaScript programmers in the world. They've been doing it for a long time. And they say they can't do it without the benefit of static typing. And so I think, I think, you know, I, I, I think that that when people say, "Hey, I, I I develop JavaScript applications all the time without the without the need for for static types, and I'm fine," they're I, I don't doubt them. They're, they're developing use cases that don't take them outside of, of, of their ability to keep track of the complexity. But there is a complexity limit when you're dealing with a language like JavaScript that doesn't really impose any limitations on you. And for people who don't who don't um, who don't need that sort of complexity in their application, then, then all the power to them. But because complexity is a problem for a certain class of applications, like really large applications, a perfect example is the HTML5 version of Angry Birds, um, which was uh, you know, a port of the, of the, app, of the, the uh, iOS and Android Angry Birds application into HTML5. When Rovio did this, they initially tried to start off by like doing it in pure JavaScript, and they found as the code base got really large, and you can imagine like a full game with like with like sprites and game logic and physics logic and all this other stuff would start to turn into tens of tens of thousands of lines of code pretty quickly. And what they found was that maintaining tens of thousands of lines of JavaScript code on a, on, on a 15 to 20 person team was like almost completely impossible. And of course, they switched to GWT, and so they achieved their HTML5 version by using GWT because it gives them uh, static typing. It also lets them share most of their code. About 80% about of the code in, in the HTML5 version of Angry Birds 
uh, is shared with the Android version because, of course, Android's written in Java, so they're able to keep most of the engine um, and uh, in, in, in untouched. And all I have to do is worry about going and plugging all the holes, like you know, making the rendering engine talk to Canvas and you know, and, and the and the audio API and stuff like that. And so, but for this for this very reason, cross compilation is a growing phenomenon. You see a lot, like every language in the world now, like is like you know, there's like Python to JS compilers, there's like Ruby to JS compilers, there's actually a C to JS compiler that's actually somewhat popular, believe it or not. There's stuff written in it, uh, like serious stuff. And so there's re I mean, there's, there are there are reasons why people want to do this. And in fact, um, I'm not going to talk about it today, but it's, it's, it's so prevalent that the W3C has noticed this. And there's a push by like Mozilla and Google uh, to introduce something called LLJS, which stands for low-level JavaScript. It's basically like a bytecode for the, for the browser. That in the future, technologies like GWT would, instead of worrying about translating Java code to JavaScript code, they would target this sort of bytecode format that would that would require them to sort of bypass the need to, to sort of figure out how to how to represent you know other languages constructs in JavaScript, and so that's coming down the line. And so I would I would say that you can expect this to increase. You, you can expect cross compilation to be an increasing phenomenon, especially given how successful the browser is as a platform. Um, but you know, I mean, HTML, is, and and so HTML is a better fit for for many problems, uh, which is which is where we're going to sort of lead into uh, the next aspect of, of this of this talk, which is which is uh, ha a rise use of HTML. Now, a a GWT classically is a programmatic UI. It's it's like Swing. If you have ever seen like a classic GWT app, it looks a lot like a Swing application. You, it, 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 in fact, they've done a very good job at sort of emulating a lot of the Swing API in term in, in terms of how it looks and how it behaves. And of course, a lot of people turn their nose off at that. They're just like, I want to create a template and I want to decorate that template with functionality, like with jQuery or something like that. I don't want to like go like new text box, add to panel, align with like align right, and like figure out all that stuff. And and we agree. We agree. That's actually not a good fit for all applications. It can be a very very tedious way of developing web front ends, especially when you have. Uh, a, a browser that native like has a native templating language, which is HTML, and it's it can be really really fast and efficient to iterate um, on on HTML and CSS, and we think we found a solution that sort of bridges that gap. Um, and I've I've already talked about this. I, I I've already I already have too many slides. So. Um, so we're going to talk about a raw UI, which is our solution to sort of getting rid of, of, of the need for programmatic UI in GWT. We're still taking full advantage of, the, of, of all of the, the benefits that I spoke about before, which is this idea of sharing code with the server, sharing model with the server, and also using familiar APIs uh, that we're all used to, like JPA, like, you know, um, you know, like like uh, bean validation and things like that. We can still use these things, um, and we can build large code bases <laughs> in Java um, that are optimized and compiled down by the Java by the the GWT Java to JavaScript compiler. But we can still build our front ends like a traditional web application. But and and we also have um, we also have like a really nice. Uh, uh, introduction to make here is that we have a really nice first class set of, of IntelliJ tooling, not for Eclipse yet. Uh, we'd like this to happen, um, but I'm going to be show I am going to be using IntelliJ IDEA tonight uh, with the the new Arai UI support plugin. Actually, it's not just the Arai UI support plugin. It supports a lot of our framework. It provides like code completion and refactoring, and you can do fine usages analysis on on, on things. It's it's really cool. So I'm just going to jump into that and, and, and show you this new technology we call Arai UI. Um, I've, I've set up a new project here. Um, it's, it's my classic live code project because I like to, to code from scratch. So this, this is a project that was created from one of our archetypes. Like we have like a hello world archetype essentially that just has like a hello world in it. I've deleted the hello world and sort of, I've pre canned I've cheated a little bit. I've added the bootstrap CSS files uh, here today because I'm gonna work with them. Um, but that's about the only thing I've cheated on. Other than this, this is, this is almost what you would get if you, if you got, went and got our, our archetype and, and blew up a project. So um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
just to start off really quickly here and create a, a new entry point. Now an entry point is, is, is what it sounds like. It is, it's the gateway into the application. Um, we have this idea, well, let's just create it first and I'll explain what we're doing. I'll call it app. I could call it anything. And so this, this, this is our, our first entry point. Now this is, this is a whole bunch of, just as a bunch of pre-canned stuff here that we can look at. Um, basically, and I'll show you this here, um, we've created a system in which you can essentially write all of, of your UI as regular HTML markup. Now this is an Arai UI template, um, but it's not a template like, like you might think. It's not a velocity template. It's not a free marker template. Um, we're not going to have placeho placeholder values in there at least not in the traditional sense. We do have placeholders, but not, not like you might think. Um, we don't, we're not going to, we don't have any special iteration constructs. Uh, we're not going to, we're, we're not going to program in this. This is a real HTML5 snippet that will be read by the browser as is. We will, we will serve the browser this HTML as you see it here. We're not going to, we're not going to transform it or do anything mystical with it. I'm going to get rid of this boilerplate, uh, this well introductory boilerplate that the the plugin created for me, and I'm just in. But you can actually see already, like this is this. You can see our new tooling here. You can actually see that it, it's it's actually very upset that I just deleted all that content from the from the uh, uh, the template file there. Actually, and I'll actually just get rid of this here, and we'll get rid of this. So. What can we do here? Well, let's just start off with a simple case. Let's start off with the, the Hello World case. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this up, and uh, we'll see what happens here. So this is just going to, to fire, fire up our, our stuff. We're going we're gonna to generate some code here and, and, and start up the, the, the application server and deploy it and, and, and translate it to HTML, uh, translate it down to, to JavaScript. And so there we go. I mean, we created a, a, a regular HTML template, um, as you might expect, and we saw, we saw, we saw our hello world there happen. So what can we do with this? Well, I can, I can, I can design my, my layout as, as I normally would. I can go ahead here and of course create a button and I'll say, I'll call it click me, like so. And if I go back now to my, uh, my Firefox window, I can hit, I can, I can refresh it and you can see there's, there's the button. But here's where it gets really here. But here, but here's where it gets really interesting, right? I mean, I can now, I, I can now work with this template from my translated Java code. So let's let's do that. I mean, how would I how would I do that? Well, let's see. What I want to do is I want to get a reference to that button in my Java code, and I want to do something with it. And that's exactly what I'll do. So I'm going to inject. What we call I'm going to inject a data field called button. Now, this is, uh, this is upset at me because the, the IDE is saying there is no such data field called button. I will ameliorate this by introducing you to my first concept here uh, called data field. Now, HTML5 has this really interesting, um, really interesting property, and that is that um, any attribute that starts with data dash is a valid custom attribute. So, when we introduce this data field attribute, we're not actually, we're not, like, so you could look at something like Angular. Like, Angular actually does, like, if you were to take an Angular template and put it into, like, the W3C HTML5 validator, it would get really mad at you and say that it's, n it's not valid markup. It would be like, what is this ng dash stuff? This is not, this is not valid markup. If you put ours into the HTML5 validator, it'll always be happy and be like, yeah, it's, it's, it's valid HTML5. Go to town. It's, it's completely spec compliant. And the truth is, is like, we are not translating this template. We really are doing, uh, we're directly working with the DOM. That's exactly what we're going to do here. So I'm going to, I'm going to import this button. Oh, I'm sorry, complete this button. That's actually an, another interesting thing. You can see our tooling is actually quite smart because it sees that we have this data field in here that is, is currently un, unhomed to a data field in its, in its uh, companion template. And you can see that my, my IDE here is basically, the, the, the Arai plugin is actually telling me here, look this, I have this button thing here that, I think that's what you probably want. And so it, it completed that for me. 
So now if I go back to my app, if I, if I go back here, you'll see that the error went away. Um, it's, it's very happy. It, it, the IDE can see that this is a, this is a valid template. And I'm going to go ahead and, and create an event handler for this, uh, for this button. And I'm going to write it in Java. And, and of course, it's, it's for button. Oops, that wrong thing. I'm going to go private, void, on, on click my button. I can, I can call this anything I want, of course. And I can accept a click event. And I'll just say, I'll use a standard JavaScript alert, which is what window alert maps to. And I'll say, hello world. If I go back here and I'm going to refresh this again and hit click me, you can see that, you can see that the JavaScript alert came up. There was no, no, there was no like round trip to the server there. Like this is as everything we've done right now is like a, a, a purely offline application. Um, we're we are literally trans. We're actually literally turning this class into JavaScript that runs, you know, just like just like any 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 JavaScript code would. Um, so, what else can we do with this? Well, we can do lots of interesting things with it. So, we can take, for example, let's well actually let's. Let's, let's put some bootstrap in there. Why don't we do that next? Let's go show how, because people are like, people are like, I don't want to use GWT. I want to use bootstrap. This is the other thing I always hear from people too. It's like this idea that if you use GWT, like a GWT-based technology, you're somehow like, you're shackled. You can't like, you can't use any of the tools that are, yeah. It, like, so this is, this is completely untrue. So let's just do some things here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a doc type tag. I'm going to make this properly formed. It's not technically proper, properly formed right now. But let's go ahead here and, and give it a style sheet. Or actually, link uh, rel style sheet um, href. And we'll say CSS dot oop, boot, boots just regular bootstrap CSS will do. We'll put that in there. What should we do here? We'll give the button uh, a class now. We can give it the. BTN button, BTN, what is BTN uh, primary, something like that. We'll go back here and, and refresh our, our application. Oops, what did I do wrong? I had something very upsetting. Oh, yeah, so it failed. I don't think that works. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. I should warn you, you guys may see bugs today because as, like I said, we're work I'm showing you a Rye 3.0 which is packed with new features and we won't be releasing it until, um, I should just look at what this is. Uh, the reason is, is that, um, it's because you didn't close the link tag. No, it's because it doesn't contain a data. It, it says it, it, try closing the No, it's fine. I don't think that's needed. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah. This is strange. Let me see here. Oh, you need a you need a root. Uh, oh. Because there's more than one root element now. I'm sorry. Yes. So actually, this is. The div that was there. You just have to name it. Yeah. So because because there's more than one root in this, so this actually is not like actually this isn't a bug. I mean we need we need when we, whenever we have more than one root to the document, you have to actually you have to create like a root to the doc. And this actually is a really powerful concept, by the way. I'll show you here. If we go here, we'll go root here like so. Is it data field or ID? Data field. There we go. Yes. So what actually what happened there was 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 uh, and it needs better error handling. But like I said, this is 3.0. It's not out yet. Um, when we when we did this, there's actually two roots to this. So this 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 is actually a, a, a sibling of link. It's not a it's not a descendant of link. And so when we did the actual DOM lookup in the brow when we did the actual DOM lookup, we weren't able to descend to find the data field here because because this had multiple roots. Probably something we could ameliorate in our code. Actually, there's no. I mean, but yeah. I mean, it's not. Big, but you can see now that we 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 actually have the the bootstrap, um, the, the the bootstrap style there. I can actually go there and put the button dot primary back in. You can stay here and go back there. There we go. So we're now so we're now using we're we're now using 
uh, regular bootstrap CSS for this stuff. So what else can we do with this, right? I mean, um, we can, we've created a, uh, an entry point, but we're not, we're, we're not like, uh, we're not limited to say, you know, create like basically having this one, one uh, template app, this one template and one widget to work with in our entire application. Of course, we can create many of them. Let's create one. So let's create a, let's create a application that we that can register a bunch of users and put them into a list. Let's do that. So how would we do that if we were going to do this in in Java? Well, I would create some model, of course. I'm going to say I don't know. I'll call it registration. And what might registration have? It might have a it might have a name, and it might have someone's age, and it might have I don't know their favorite color. Like so. So let's, go, let's generate a whole bunch of getters and setters for this. Now I'm going to introduce you to something called uh, array data binding, which is actually really, really cool. It allows us to, well, of course, like, well, the first, well, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're building all of our, all of our UI in, in regular HTML markup. And since we want to do our business logic in Java, it stands to reason that we want we're going to want to keep whatever the state is in an input box or a text box in sync with some sort of model. And so that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to create the, a, new, a new class here. And I'm going to put this, this oh, sorry, bindable attribute on it. And this is actually going to tell the, the Arrive framework this, that this class can be used to bind two, uh, you know, two, two elements within the UI in between that. So let's... So what can we do here? Let's go ahead here and create a, I don't know, let's uh, a n call it new registration. Actually, I can, why don't I save myself some work here and go new array, oops, new array templated widget, new registration. And what is the new registration going to do? Well, it's going to have some model, which is going to be, Oops. Uh, it's going to be a registration object. And what else is it going to do? It's, uh, it's going to have, well, let's, go, let's, let's, let's jump into our template here, and, which you can see I can do quite quickly with my awesome tooling here. And let's, let's create a simple form here. Let's create a form. And I actually don't want this to, to submit when I click on it, so I'll just do that. And what are we going to do here? I'll say input type equals text. Uh, what is it? Uh, data field name, like so. I'll have input, ty input type equals text, data field age. And of course, we're going to want to have like an add button or something. So I'll do that. I'll say add registration. Use type equals number. Good job. Awesome. And we'll create a register button here. And so this is this is this is like, you know, this is all pretty familiar at this point. I think we can all let's, we can also we can also do this the, the nice HTML5 E way and I'll put a label on this here. Uh, name. Now we can say label. Like so. And so now we have this here. Let's go back to our registration object. So, so now we can go back to to our to this this new registration widget, which is backed by that. B now, one thing I, one, one thing that might be a mystery and I haven't explained so far is that why is that backed by this beam? Well, it's because it has the same name as this class. It actually doesn't have to, and I'll do that here. I'll actually change this to I'll rename this to new registration uh, template, like so. And you can see now all of a sudden this is like problematic. It's like the URI UI template file can't be resolved, which is true. So I'll go ahead and tell it, um, and you can actually see like it, it uh, that the, co the it, it's aware of all the data fields here in the in the uh, in the in the in the tooling, and I can complete on that here. So there 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 it's happy now. I, I could have saved that by keeping the files name the same thing, but I, I do that just to show you um, why that seemed so magical before. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and inject um, our data field now. Now we can do one of two things, right? Like I can name 
I, I can name the field of this injected data field the same thing as the data field and it will resolve that fine. Or I can look it up here. I can say I want this to, to be the name data field. I don't have to do this, but I, I will. And I'll say it's bound. And this will be a text box, of course. So one of the, so so actually you're probably wondering like what 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 is this, right? Because I'm doing I'm doing HTML. Five, and I have this input box here, and why, what is this text box? So GWT, of course, has wrapper, already built-in wrapper types for all of the HTML primitives. So what, what we can do is we can take advantage of the fact that we have wrappers for all the HTML primitives, and Array UI will simply wrap, when it, when it binds these elements, it can wrap around those existing primitives, and that, that's how we, how we get that there. And so, of course, bound, um, bound is telling me, of course, that, that um, it can't, it can't resolve um, its property, but let's let's make this simpler for ourselves, right? So we have we have our new registration here. It's it's, call, it's called name. So let's if we call this if we get rid of this now it's going to be broken. But if I just change this to name, suddenly everything aligns and everything goes away. The 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 data field that field is now e equals name. In the case of the registration object, it's also name. So everything's happy. Their, their framework will now know that those all mean the same thing. And I'll also go here and I'll say inject data field. Uh, it'll bound private um, text box age. And of course, we have uh, the submit button. I don't actually have to inject that, by the way. I'll, I'll, I can directly, I can put an event handler on a non-injected uh, button, which I'll do here. You can see uh, here's the register button. And I'll just go void on click event. Like so, um, it's going to warn. It's it's actually warning me this won't actually work because I have to sync that event in the DOM, which I will do like this because it's not injected and therefore not managed. So now, so so, so now when 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 we click this, we want to to add a registration. But let's, let's well let's just print this out for now. I'll just say uh, window alert, um, new registration. I'll go ahead and put a two string on the registration so it has some, uh, let's say, name, age, age. Oh, wait, we, we've left out favorite color. How can we do this? How can we leave out favorite color? Uh, I'll put that in there. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's text. favorite like so and go back to our new registration here let's add that guy in oops so the other thing, the other thing we also haven't mentioned, and if you've never seen this before, is that I'm using this at inject annotation, which actually does happen to be, in fact, a standard Java annotation. So we're at, I've never mentioned it up until now, but everything I'm doing is actually client-side CDI. So this is JSR 299 uh, CDI beans managed in the client um, by what we do in the array framework. So all this dependency injection is happening client side. And so this framework is built on top of, of this, of this uh, dependency injection framework, which is the same programming model that we use on the server. So now that I have my new registration object, well, how are we going to make this work? I don't know. I'm going to, let's figure this out. So I'm going to, I have my bu original button here. I'm going to go ahead here and say, change it to add registration. Like so. And kind of go back here. And so now when we click this, well, what do we do? Well, I have an idea. I'm going to inject an instance of the re uh, of, of uh, new registration. And so now when it, when it clicks, I'm going to uh, get it, like so. Assign that to a variable. And also do something else here. Let's do this. Inject root panel. Now, the root the, this is the, the, the root panel is the uh, basically just the root of the DOM, like right the root the root window of the DOM. Uh, so we can 
and, 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 and underneath the surface, all these widgets are just regular DOM objects. So what I'm really going to do is that when we click this, I'm going to add this new registration to the DOM. And so let's, let's see what happens now when we, when, we, when we put this all together. So I have Hello World now, and I have my add registration. And now, when I click, and now when I click on it, look, it actually added that, that stuff into the DOM. It's not very pretty. I haven't done anything to pretty it up. But we can now, let, let's actually see what happens now when we fill this out. I'm, my name's Mike Brock. I'm 32. Surprise, surprise. My favorite color is blue. <coughs> and so, and, and you can see that that all worked as expected, right? I mean, and, I mean, and, and so, I mean, th there's, you can see there actually is like a real benefit, you know, to like the tooling and the static typing that we get, right? I mean, uh, Yes, I mean, there's, there's, there's like, there's some iter like the iteration uh, of something like this is a little bit slower than JavaScript, but I mean, like we, we were able to proceed with great confidence that our stuff would work as expected, and this you could, you could use that registration object on the server. You don't have to write it. Yes, that registration object you could can be also compile it to a class file and deploy it to the server. <laughs> so, that's important. so what else can we do with this, right? I mean, like that, that's pretty cool. Um, so one thing that's important to realize here is that, and this is quite interesting, uh, I, I, I just went ahead and did this without explaining it, and it deserves an explanation because what I really said here is I want to, I want the client side bean manager, the bean manager that runs in the browser that I uh, provides to provide me a handle into the bean manager that can give me a new instance of this bean every time I call get on it. In fact, just for the hell of it, let's refresh the application and add it twice when we do this, just to sort of see how this actually works. Oh, oh, oh. You've added the same node. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. <laughs> so now when we do this, you'll see, look, look what actually happened, right? So we, ought, we, we just got our first uh, our first example of like uh, the, the power of like code reuse with with our dependency injection framework because we simply specified a this new registration template this widget and over here I said look I want to I want to I want to get I want to create instances of it by creating a an, basically with an instance provider which is a, by the way once again is a standard uh, CDI Java X enterprise inject uh, API that we're supporting in the client. So what, what, what's really amazing about what you're seeing happen here in Arai is that a lot of this is not Arai proprietary code. It's actually Java EE6 uh, compliant programming model that's running in the browser. So uh, whether or not you're impressed by that, your mileage will vary. So so, so, so where else? So where else? Where else can we go with this, right? Um, so we have our new registration object. You've been showing live editing the templates yet. That's a nice. Live editing the templates. Yeah. So Jonathan wants me to show live editing the templates. In fact, I want to show that too. <laughs> so um, how do I? Uh, where are we here? Ah. I think my screen's too small. IntelliJ is not showing me the little live edit button. Where is it? Yeah, there was like a view, load, reload in browser, open in browser. No, 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 in Chrome. So I'm on. A, so the reason why Chrome is not my default uh, browser, even though I like it better, is because I'm using uh, the Mac, the Retina MacBook, and it has, as you know, it has like you know like some like a pixel density, uh, like an insane pixel density. It's like over, it's like tw over 2,600 pixels across. And uh, Chrome doesn't run very well, like like full screen. It like it's like choppy. It's just not optimized for the amount of pixels it has to push. Whereas I guess Apple put more work into Safari to make it render better. But that's why that's why it's not my run. But anyways, that's that's a side thing. So so one of the great things that we get right because a lot of people say like in in, in Gwit right they. Uh, the thing they don't like is they have to like recompile every time they want to see changes. But we've done something here, right? We've cheated because we're actually building our UI in regular HTML, right? So we can, we get all of the advantages of being able to design our UI just as we would design any regular uh, app. So I mean, I now have this uh, uh, live editing feature on. So if I go here and change this to Hello World to, I don't know, uh, Registration Manager, and I'm not sure it's going to show up at the same time. You can act 
had I had I had enough space on my screen, you would have seen that that was updating like while I was typing. So, I mean, we we were we're, we're able to we're able to um, you know work with the, the templates in real time, like just as we would e expect them to. Um, so we're not when when it comes to sort of like making things work right and making things line up correctly with like CSS and stuff like that. A raw UI really does take away that biggest complaint about Gwit because that's what people hated about Gwit, right? Is that like when you have a big application and you needed to compile it, you had to go through like a really, really long cycle to, to go back and check to see if that CSS tweak you made actually caused the, 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 the stuff to line up the way you wanted it. And so one of the advantages that we get out of our UI is we completely just like dispense with that sort of design cycle because we're using, we are using pure HTML and we're just decorating that HTML with functionality. So, so this is what I was kind of getting at when I said that we were trying to go after the best of both worlds for people who are building really, really large applications. Um, so, what else can we do here? Well, let's let's go back here. Let's create a. I'm gonna create another thing here called uh, registration widget. Please tell me how I am for time. Uh, if I'm getting if I'm getting too far, I, I can I can uh, speed things up. 25 minutes, okay. So also showing you like some of the other powerful things that we can get out of this. So I'm going to create this uh, a registration widget, and what I and what I want to get out of this is, um, I want to basically create like a, a an object which will model the appearance of um, these registrations in a list. And Christian here has created a, a, a nice, amazing tool for for um, powering this. So. I'll go to my registration widget here, and well, what's my registration widget going to look like? Well, it's going to contain the registration data that I want to display, because I want to display it in basically sort of like a table-like format, right? And so I want to have some sort of widget that like represents it. And so let's go ahead here, and I'll create a span here with like data field name. Uh, I'll do this kind of messily for now. We'll worry about making it look pretty in a bit. Um, then I'll say I'll just do it like so for now. Um, what was the other one? Age. Like so. Let's make this put this on a different line and then f and then the color that the, the color that we liked. I still have not gotten over my American spelling of color after living in the US for so long. I keep catching myself. But do I? I have the American spelling of favorite. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. Impressive. <laughs> I I lived in the U.S. for quite a while, and I and I and I had the Canadian spellings beaten out of me, and now I'm having the Canadian spellings beaten back into me. So it's 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 very upsetting. So so I have this registration widget now. Of course, like you know, what I want to do with it? I mean, I want to bind data to it. So. We've seen this before. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to I'm going to inject to my model, which is the registration object that I created, and this is going to be my widget that represents this registration. Um, and we'll decorate it with functionality and stuff. And I'll show you that in a second. So what are we going to do? We're going to inject a uh, data field here for well, what is this? Going to be one for name. This will be. This is even yeah. It has to be bound. Bound. Um, and this will be uh, inline label. Now, actually, why don't I just do this again? Save myself work. Um, so, one of the one of the one of the nice things that we that we do get here, and, and I mean, there is there is more typing involved here, but you are you are seeing that we are able to also get the best of both worlds when it comes to th like things like dependency injection because we're actually combining nice declarative dependency injection with dependence with with uh, with information hiding so you'll notice here that I'm injecting onto a private field here I won't go through the magic that we have to uh, do to actually make that possible although it seems impossible um, but we we are able to achieve like you know complete information hiding here, so where no one can write code against this composite that's going to like mess with this stuff. Uh, so let's I'll just copy this stuff here like so. This one will be what age and 
This one is uh, favorite color. Ameri See, it's American and Canadian spelling together. It's it's like a it's like a it's this 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 brotherhood of man in North America. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they've they've always kind of. We'll we'll talk about that later. Um, so so yeah. Um, I, I, I I I I mean, strictly speaking, where are we here? All right. I was going to say something really inappropriate, and I stopped myself. So what are we going to do here? We're going to go back to our app. <coughs> let's, in let's inject a new concept. It's called a list widget. Wait, 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 wait. That's not what I want to do. We want to have a, a widget with our registrations, which has a list. OK, all right. You can. So I'm, I'm actually going to create my reg like a registrations table here. Now, like, the nice thing is is that like as I go along here, like as you've already seen, I'm creating reusable components as I go along that I can compose into more complicated things. So I want to create like I want to create a, a registrations table, which is this one will be pretty pretty simple. It'll it'll be I could have actually generated this with my IDE, but I I didn't because I'm a fool, um, and. Uh, I have to create the, the HTML companion class that goes with it here. I'll give it a div here. This one will be pretty simple, right? It'll just like have a, a we'll, we'll just have a div here with a data field that uh, is the table. And well, like a reg I'm going to put create a registrations holder and. I'm trying to make this as reasonably complicated so you can kind of see like how we can compose things without getting too complicated. I mean, we could do this in an easier way, but I want to sort of show as much as I can in the time that I have. Um, and so the registrations will hold a list of, um, of uh, registration. Actually, do I want to give it a default value or? <laughs> All right. No. <laughs> yeah, whatever. All right, so give it a default. So where are we going to go here? Where are we going? Where are we here? So I have like, I, so now what I want to do is my registrations holder is going is that's actually the the bindable widget and I got my registration table. So what do I do now? Let's inject my registrations table and let's comp let's add let's actually add that into my app here. Now we could actually where we could actually compose we we shouldn't do that that way. We should actually inject this as a data field, right? Yeah. <coughs> yes. Why am I doing programmatic coding when I don't have to? So registrations table, so we'll like, where is it here? So the app, we want it to just like appear here. Data field, oh no, sorry, div, data field, um, table, like so. Yeah. H2 registrations. And so there we go, we have that there. So now what we're going to do is we have our new reg we have our new registry we have our new uh uh where are we here? Regis I I've created s badly named things. So what is our new registration going to do now? It's going to inject the registrations well, it can't inject the registrations holder. We need to Yes. I need <laughs> we have here. You need a widget for your holder. Yeah, we have a we have a registrations holder which has a list of registrations, and I want to bind them. You don't have a widget for that in the whole class that represents that list of things. Yeah, I have a registrations table. Oh, there. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'd already created it, and I've lost track of my. Of this. I'm losing my mind as I get older. Okay, so inject. Of course, this is all right. Inject model, registrations holder. Right. 
and yes. And so now what do we do? We take that and we inject a, this is what we needed to get to, registration to our registration widget. Yes. yes. Hmm. So <coughs> and there we go. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Registration widget is not within its bound. Oh, yes, that's correct. That's true. And so let's go ahead and uh, impl I I implement this. This will return the registration. And this one. Now I'm really scared because we found a bug with this earlier. <laughs> and I hope I'm not about to trip over the same bug. You've written a lot of code since the last time we saw anything work. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here's my, so my, I have my registrations table. And so what do we want to do now? Um, well, when we create it, of course, let's go ahead here and create a, like a, an init method or something. Uh, and it will do what? We have the holder. Well, no, no, we don't have to do anything, do we? We just do this. I think this is what I'm going to do. I should have pre-planned this better. Add registration. Holder dot get registrations dot add registration. I think I'm about to do this right. Yeah, and then I have my new registrate. I have my new registration uh, widget. And here we go. Now what I want to do is inject my registrations holder right here, which is actually. I, no, that's not what I, I need better registrations table. And actually I want this to be a singleton so I can share it around. And now let's do this. All right, I'm taking a huge risk that this is gonna blow up in my face like never before. And of course, now what I wanna do is when this thing is done, I want to inject the uh, the uh, what am I doing here? Uh, inject it. I want to inject the root panel here. I make it clean up. I'm going to make this this uh, new registration thing clean up after itself. And also, it's going to um, inject the the bean manager because this gets to I get to show off a little bit here. Oops, sorry. What is it? IOC Synchronous Bean Manager. We changed the name of it. I'm not used to the new one. What is it called again? The new, what do we, we just renamed it. Yeah, IOC. I'll find it. We just renamed it to Sync Bean Manager. Yes. Okay, the reason why this is be we renamed it is because we have this new thing called the Asynchronous Bean Manager and whatever. But what I want, what I really want to ha have happen here is I want, when we click this, I want this thing to remove itself from the DOM and then I want the Bean Manager to uh, destroy its, this, this bean. So I. Like, this don't get or something. Um, no, 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 I won't. No, I won't. So anyways, so now that the, now when we do that registration, I'm hoping we get, we get some, some interesting behavior here. All right, I'm going to take a huge risk that this, this is going to blow up like never before. <laughs> to the list widget? Wait. OK. What happens? Add registration. Mike? 12 blue. Okay. 
It cleaned up after itself, but we don't see that we don't. So we didn't get any explosions, right? So we, we have all compiling code. So where's our registrations holder here? Um, where's the, we, we bind that to the <coughs> registrations holder. Oh, yes, it's not even bound. Aha. <laughs> I don't even know this is going to work because I don't know if I'm on a late enough, late, latest, late enough version of this. Well, there's one way to find out. If, if I'm, I'm taking the risk of showing a feature that we implemented, as Christian said, less than 24 hours ago. Um, that, that's, that's how I roll, though, right? Um, all right, Mike, 16, blue. No, nothing. Do I even call this? Well. <laughs> Am I even on the, on the, on the internet here? I wanna, this is. Yeah, see this? Yeah, there's new things. I should rebase over this. Oh wait, git commit. I, don't, I actually, I, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to that. This, this is, is a code quality <laughs> <laughs> You get to see this. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna build this as fast as I can. Uh, Gwit. You're gonna see that commit on GitHub. <laughs> There's nothing that can't be undone. All right, I'm, I'm bet. So I don't have this new feature. So Christian added this new feature that I wanted to demo that I mistakenly thought was already in the code base. And the idea that it was automat it's automatically going to. Have you seen the code? Am, am I, have I have I emulated your stuff correctly? I don't know. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I, you're almost out of time. You've got five minutes. To yeah. Right. I've skipped all the unit tests and stuff. So we don't need those. Um, <laughs> where, where is so so I have I have this I have this registrations table. It's a singleton. Uh, it's templated, and I have this registration widget uh, that rep that is what I have in that table. And I have this registrations holder which is bindable, which. And I have this app here, and I have this new registration widget, which opens up. And when I click that, I add the registration to that holder. Where's the logo? It's called right here. Yeah. It's a singleton, though, so it's fine. It's a table that's called Yeah. Well, the holder is actually bindable. So I'm trying to make a ride do as much work for me as possible. Oops. Um, yes, there we go. All right, let's try this one more time. If this works, then then I'll, I'll be really happy with myself. Yeah. <laughs> if it's not, whatever. I'm showing you code that won't even be final until like September or October, so. But you get the gist of um, even if I can't get this really advanced binding example to, to work yet. All right, add registration. Mike, 32, blue. No. Not sure why. But we can actually, you know what? Why don't we figure out what's going on? This is another awesome thing about GWT is that we can, even though we're doing it like this, we can actually put a breakpoint down here and we can debug right from our browser. So let's do this. This is this is this is fun. Explain why what dev mode is and why this works. You didn't say anything about dev mode yet. Yes, yeah, so we're using dev mode right now, which is uh, relies uh, relies on a plugin in the browser to sort of communicate back to the IDE like what's going on. All right, so I'm going to say Mike, like 16, blue. And now when I click this, actually, you see the breakpoint gets hit here. So I'm actually, let's, let's actually try and figure out like why, why this isn't working. So we get, the we get the registrations back, and it adds it. And you can see here, we can actually go ahead and look at all the stuff which was going on. Uh, we have the bindings here. 
Uh, let's see. There's an entry in here, there's a values collection. Um, where's our holder? Holder has a list. There's no registrations in it. Or wait. No, there is a, there we are. That's what we added. No. Hmm. Do you know, Christian? This is your feature. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obviously not using it right. Do you know? Okay. I tried. So yeah, I mean, I mean, basic, basically, the theory was is that this registrations holder would be injected here as the holder, and that uh, thing would add there, and this would be bounded to the template, and this registrations table is injected here. Well, I guess I guess that that one that one huge thing that I took a risk on, which was like the latest feature that blew up in my face. So don't demo features that are less than twenty four hours old. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you you can see that despite me using a a, a feature that's that's uh, less than twenty four hours old, um, you can see that like you know you can actually be like really productive uh, regardless and use like a pretty powerful programming model. Um, we saw we we at least saw that the, the data binding itself works. If I go back here to the um, to the registrations to the registrations here, I'll you know I can go ahead here and I can intercept that here and we'll just see that working again. Um, to string. Oops. Uh, where are we here? I'll just return here and run that again. But we, you know, we, we built we built a reasonably complex application in a short period of time uh, you, uh, using using an incomplete feature. I'll be uh, despite that not working. But you can see here though that it's you know we, we think that there we think that there's something here. We didn't I didn't I, I, I didn't I didn't get to show. Um, you know any of like the server interactions, which I think are really compelling. I, you know this this whole client side programming model is just one side to array. Of course, we have a whole model that uh, with working with the server. We have like a server push system, so you can push messages to the to the client uh, completely asynchronously without worrying about that. And that's a huge part of the framework. But we we but the the client side stuff I think is is has become a lot more compelling, and I think will be when when this stuff is ready uh, to ship this fall. So. Um, that's my, my brief introduction to Arai UI and how we do uh, UI with, with, with Arai in the future. Does anyone have any questions about what they saw today? And, I, once, and I'd like to apologize again. Uh, I, I took a huge risk trying to demo something that um, I myself wasn't fully familiar with considering how new it was and I didn't know. <laughs> it was but a well-defined well set of features that work properly that were released last week. Yes. didn't include this list binding. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. If I have an application in Spring, so I think this model matches perfectly with the Spring application. Because I, w I was thinking to use JSF to convert that to Kana. So, what is it? So, I mean, the whole sort of JSF uh, versus GWT thing is something we talk about a lot. Like we, we view our stuff as sort of like a natural migration path from JSF because JSF is very much a certain, like they have, they do rich stuff in the client with like uh, JavaScript that they emit, but it's really, it's really like a mixture of, of server side and client side code. And Arai is really on the other side of the paradigm where you're not really, you're not really building a, a server driven application, you're driven, you're driven, you're, you're building a client side application and much and and all you're really doing is you're exchanging data with the server you're not the server doesn't know anything about UI anymore and that's true for like a lot of the modern JavaScript stuff too um, as for like yes I mean like 
the stuff I showed today I don't think is a good analog to swing, but GWT has a really good analog to swing application. So if you like to develop that way, um, GWT certainly has a huge swing-like UI library that you can work with. So the templates on website, canvas templates? Canvas templates? Uh, client-based, client-based, HTML page rendering templates? Um, well, we don't provide any pre-made templates. Like, we, like you know, you're expected to sort of, you know, uh, build them yourself like I did today. Uh, or you could have a designer do them. Actually, I didn't really mention, Jonathan mentioned that, I'm not sure if you all heard, but one of the, the advantages to this approach is you can actually have a designer build you regular HTML, and then all you do is, like the developer, you start going through and you start attaching these data field elements to them, and you decorate that existing functionality. So a designer, so you can actually take designer made code with a raw UI and you can decorate it with functionality. Like even something like Angular, you know, has a, a drawback there in that it has like, you know, like directives like for like looping and things like that. Same with like JSP. Whereas a raw UI at least has the the benefit that we can actually you can actually you can train a designer to create a data field. It's a lot harder for the to trade it train a designer to write uh, control flow. Uh, code inside the template. You have to do that. So a raw UI doesn't doesn't have any control flow in its templates, which makes which makes the way that we work with it to be completely non-destructive. So in in corporate environments where you have like a designer ma making a template and stuff like that, a raw, is a, perf a raw UI is a perfect fit. And indeed, that was actually one of our primary considerations when we decided to set out and and, and design this. Is one of the biggest uh, criticisms that we would hear especially from corporate customers who are interested in GWT. They're interested in the benefits that it would get. They understood that they would get this model sharing and stuff. But this idea that the designers would mock something up and then the programmers would have to spend the next six months writing swing-like code that mimicked what the designer had created was a serious drawback. This allows you to tr take designer code directly and start putting functionality into it. <coughs> and so you can decorate existing templates with this. We don't make them for you, though. If you can find some nice te uh, templates for your application out there, you can go to town. So this will be available in September. So I, I, am I, I, I should be, I should be, I, I should be more clear about about this. We have stable releases out. Arai 2.3 was just released, um, and does have Arai UI in it. By the way, Arai UI is not new to Arai 3.0. Uh, in fact, 90% of what I showed you today is available today as a stable release, uh, and you can go and get it. Uh, there's a lot of new stuff that we're working on, and so the uh, in, in Arai 3.0, and we've gone in and we've re we, we've reworked a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff's been rewritten under the hood, and so the code bases have started to diverge. But Arai is out there in production today, and almost everything I showed you today is is stable, supported code. Uh, you know, so. Uh, don't don't think that you can't use like the lit the list binding stuff that I tried to show you today is an example of something that's not there in Arai 2.3. You don't need it. You can write the code man like I I could have actually just gone and written the code man. It would have been like two or three lines of code to tell it just to update the list and it would have showed up there. I was trying to make the declarative model do it for me, which is a new thing, uh, but it it didn't it it it, it that, that didn't work. Uh, and like in Arai 2.3, of course, I would have had to have written like two or three lines of code to, to make it update the list. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can you can use uh, Arai 2.3 today. Yep. Where does this get deployed? Is any any JE6 web container? Or JBoss? Uh, you do not need JBoss. Uh, we have people who are running uh, Arai on Spring, uh, believe it or not, and on Glassfish, and on Tomcat, and on Jetty. We, uh, we, we definitely uh, spend a lot of time uh, making sure our stuff works really, really well with JBoss technologies. Uh, CDI uh, Javi and a lot of Javi E6 was, of course, a J were JBoss led efforts, and uh, so we've we've spent a lot of time trying to promote promote integration with those technologies. We think Arai works best when you use it with uh, with with Javi E6 uh, technologies, and it, and we have. You know, we of course have, have, have put a lot of work into making sure our stuff works well on JBoss AS. But I can tell you that we have people in our community who are in fact running Arai applications quite fine on non-JBoss app servers. We're not, we, we don't do anything which is inherently uh, incompatible with other app servers. Everything Mike showed today you could deploy on like Apache or Nginx or whatever. Like, 
you don't need a Java web server at all for anything Mike just showed. But if you want to communicate Java objects to the server and do stuff with them, then yeah, any Java web server. Yeah, actually, why don't we, uh, you know, if, if I just have like two minutes left, if I'm not doing this, uh, why don't we just drive this point home? Because uh, what I'll do here uh, is I'll show you, because everything I did today did not rely on a server at all. It was, it was, a, completely, it was a completely client side application. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this application, the production version of this application, and I'm going to, and it's going to emit some HTML and JavaScript. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll load the app off my file system. I won't I won't serve it from a, uh, I won't serve it from a web server. Uh, and there we, and so there we go. Here we, we we just we just we just compiled it down to to JavaScript. And uh, I know that Mike is like looking at this and seeing how much faster like uh, modern versions of GWT are <laughs> compared to what he had to live with. Not doing it anymore. <laughs> um, so anyway, so so anyways, we'll go we'll go into uh, into into here, and so here's here's like the outputted thing. This is like a regular war, but there's no server side point uh, server side component to it. So I'll just like open this up here. I'll come to Firefox here, and I will literally just drag my app.html into here, and you can see this is loaded from file colon slash slash users, and you'll see I'll go ahead in here and click add registration, and I go Mike age 16 <laughs> color blue add registration, and you see that that there's no server there, so this everything I did, including the CDI code and all the other stuff, was truly translated into completely portable JavaScript. I could run, I could pull my iPhone out right now and, and run it there too, and it and it works fine. It's very good. In fact, uh, what's one of the uh, another one of the reasons why people use GWT to begin with is, uh, uh, in, it, especially early days, uh, a lot GWT GWT's really really good at at uh, at kerning out uh, browser incompatibilities. That's one of the things that the GWT compiler does a lot does does for you. Uh, is it's aware of a lot of browser quirks and stuff like that, and, and, and deals with them appropriately. Like GWT also, like for example, uh, you can use like Canvas, GWT Canvas on IE6. It like puts stuff in there to like make it work, <laughs> even though it doesn't support it. So uh, GWT, GWT actually brings a whole bunch of like HTML5 stuff all the way back to IE6 when you use it as a compile target. It provides a whole bunch of uh, like scaffolding. JavaScript to enable those features to work. So yeah, I mean, it's it's actually a really good tool if you're worried about browser compatibility. So this technology is a layer on top of GW. Yeah. Yes, we rely completely on it. Without it, there would be no awry. Uh, so you provide features which are complementary to GW. Yeah, it's completely complementary. They're complementary, and sometimes they're complete outright replacements. Uh, GWT offers a whole bunch of things that that awry has wholesale replacements for. Um, that you're probably, if you're using, if you're in the Arai world, you're probably best best off using the Arai components. I, di I, I didn't really show anything today that, well, Arai UI in, in some ways is a wholesale replacement for some aspects of, of GWT, um, but I didn't show any, I didn't, we didn't show like the JAXRS framework today or the JPA framework or the, uh, or the bus framework or RPC framework. Our RPC framework, for example, is a, is a wholesale replacement for the built-in GWT RPC framework. We think it's easier to use. It's less boilerplate. Uh, you can use it with a few annotations as opposed to, yeah, with, with the GWT one, you have to actually have to create a servlet for each like RPC uh, service and stuff manually. And so, and, and our stuff doesn't require things like that. So, so I mean, like we're complementary and we're, and we're not. Uh, where, where we are complementary is in more, more broadly is the fact that you leverage GWT as a compiler. So in many ways, uh, GWT, GWT is both a, a complementary component and it's also a means to an end for us. So um, we, we straddle the line there of, 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 of what, what we're bringing to the table. What's your feeling on Google's long-term commitment to GWT? They've, so a lot of people have thought that they've stepped away, but they've actually stepped it up uh, of, of late, actually. And there's, there, there will be talks on, on, on GWT at, at Google I.O. this year, I know, because I'll be at one of them. Uh, uh, speaking, uh, and uh, they've they've actually are still hiring for the GWT team today. There there was a misconception that happened uh, that I can speak to uh, in in the in, in that 
that Google had basically abandoned Gwit. And it certainly seemed like that, even to us, actually, internally in the team. We had questions for a while. Um, it eventually emerged like what was really going on, and it was ultimately that uh, the original founder of Gwit, Bruce Johnson, had left the company and taken a whole bunch of the team with him to create a startup outside of Google. And so uh, that, that, of course, was, was quite devastating because the Gwit team lost like you know, a huge section of its engineering talent. And of course, it took a long time for them to back to bring people back in and come up to come up to speed with the code base. Uh, Ray Cromwell uh, took over as as lead of the project, but for them, they're in a large organization. I mean, Google has literally literally hundreds of projects internally, and some of them are externally facing that use Gwit. And so, a large part of what the Gwit people at Google are paid to do is to support Gwit's own product development efforts. And because they had lost so much of their team, they spent so much of their time uh, uh, basically just doing internal support and essentially all research and development ground to a halt. That's not true anymore. It's moving forward. Uh, like we're, uh, the, there's, a, there's a public roadmap now which is available. Uh, much of the compiler is being rewritten. GWT 3.0 will be an incremental compiler, not a big static whole world compiler. So, so, all those, like, so when you start to have like a really, really large application, those, those 10 minute compiles will now be gone. If you go ahead and change one file, uh, GWT will now have a, uh, will, now, will now use a uh, differential approach. It'll it'll translate just that one class, and then it will have a separate linker, which will be able to link against all the existing translated code. And so, Gwit's compiler will will be much much faster, and the, you'll be. Able, in fact, the whole plan is to make the Gwit compiler so fast that it doesn't even need a development mode. The idea that you could actually just have like a daemon running in the background that could literally compile things in two or three seconds, and you could just like run like basically um, produ almost production like JavaScript uh, as you develop. And so. And that's a huge effort, and Google's investing heavily in that right now. So uh, we wouldn't say that they've backed off on their investment to that. They can't afford to, really. They, One they, of the public-facing apps that's developed with Quit is AdWords, and they need that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the bigger ones, too, is the Play Store. Uh, the Google Play Store is a GWT application. Uh, that's, that's fairly big for them. Uh, Android ecosystem's huge for them. So. Uh, the new Google Groups that they deployed last year is Gwit. Uh, I think Calendar is Google Calendar. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that is Gwit. Um, Google Docs is not Gwit. It's JavaScript with the Closure compiler, but the mobile version of it is. When you go to the mobile version of Google Docs, that's actually written in Gwit. <laughs> When you say native code, you mean like, a, you mean like NACL and stuff? You mean NACL and Chrome? Uh, that, just, that just reminds me of ActiveX, and so I'm not, I'm not too hip on that idea. <laughs> Seems like a really bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other, any, any other questions? I'm sorry, I'm sorry that the demo, I mean, the demo went mostly okay until the end, but, I, but yeah, I mean, this is a, uh, this is the whole team here. Uh, three of us are here. Uh, not all these people are dedicated on the team, but these are all people who we consider part of the team, uh, like because they're regular committers and they they do thing. We have we have another full time member here, Eric uh, uh, Jandewitt. He's a re he's a recent member. He's actually responsible for mobile RI, so he's spending 100% of his time on 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 everything on taking all the stuff that you see here and making it uh, easy to write. Uh, mobile mobile web apps and also like things like a Cordova web app. So and we have that today actually in Arai 3. You connect. We have Arai Cordova. So we already have it working that you can write applications that we did today and you can actually compile it down to native code uh, using Cordova, like iOS and Android apps and stuff. So that's something that you'll see in Arai 3.0. Uh, Eric Whitman. I, I couldn't find his Twitter handle. I don't even know if he's on Twitter, um, but. Uh, he he's actually responsible for the new internationalization framework uh, for Arai. Uh, we we didn't show that today. It would have been actually kind of cool to show that today. But we have a really really cool internationalization framework uh, that allows you to sort of to to uh, to internationalize Arai UI templates in a in a really 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 awesome way, which still keeps that non-destructive template philosophy alive, and is a really really cool. Um, and Lincoln Baxter. Some of you have actually met him because he spent a few weeks here in Toronto and he came to the Jug and I actually think he talked. Uh, he is uh, he is actually the one who created a RIUI. 
he's not here today. Uh, but he's actually the, the uh, initiator of, 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 a right of what I showed today. So uh, there, that's our GitHub address. Uh, we currently have two project sites right now. The one on the right will eventually become the main one at some point. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's uh, our, our, our look at Arai UI. Now I'm going to get drunk. <laughs>